I think that people know me from my work. I've been extremely active and engaged in the world through my political actions, my political activity. Uh, we've seen since 1971 at Choices, I think over a million women uh, for, not only for abortions, for gynecology, for prenatal care, for behavioral health. So we all, my staff, have touched those lives. Actually, this is a very propitious time to do this interview because today is my birthday. So I was born 73 years ago in 1946 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My life was very disciplined and serious and solitary. I uh, wanted to be a concert pianist and I practiced about three or four hours a day. So that started early, 9, 10, um, and uh, I would go to school, come home, and practice, uh, and then read. I was reading Nietzsche when I was 11 or 12, so I would say it was a very serious, solitary childhood. I am an only child. I had one or two close friends, but I was never terribly social in that sense. I have a very interesting family background. I have two, I like to describe it in a sense as two rivers that flow through me. One is the entrepreneurial adventuring side of my father, who um, was English and my grandparents were, and actually were in Kansas in the Civil War. And uh, one of them was a prospector, hid gold, and I'm told owns a quarter or a third of Oregon. Never got to meet him, but I will eventually. <laughs> um, so that's sort of the entrepreneurial adventuresome side of me. And oh, well, of course, we have people on that side of the family that are Shakespeare actors and uh, teach Shakespeare, and that's uh, very much a part of me, one of my passions. On my mother's side is Russian, and um, musicians, and rabbis, and radicals. Actually, my great-grandparents tried to bomb the Tsar, were sent to Siberia, and uh, actually escaped somehow, made their way, and I met them once in, in Staten Island. Actually, I write, I open my memoirs with that, with that memory. I went to the High School of Music and Art. I think it was on 135th Street in Harlem at the time. And I was living in Queens with my parents. And I had to travel about an hour and a half each way to go to high school. And my mother was very upset about this. She just didn't understand why I wouldn't go to Forest Hills High. <laughs> So, you know, there's no question in my mind that I have to go to music and art. And it, it was great. It was, uh, you know, a very special place. It still is. You know? So, yeah, I went to music and art. I decided I didn't want to go to college. I didn't need to go to college. I was going to be a great concert pianist. So what did concert pianists do in my teenage romantic literary mind? They went to Paris, they studied, and they starved. So <laughs> that's what I did. I went to Paris, and I studied, and, you know, I mean, it's where I really learned to love bread and cheese, because that was all I could afford to eat. Um, then I went, and I lived in Cornwall for a while, learned how to fox hunt with a friend of mine, just did, traveled all over, and my father got ill, so I had to come back to the States, and my early adventuresome days ended. <laughs> When I'm about 22, I think to myself, well, I think I'm interested in how I work. I'm interested in how people work, how the world works. I'll be a psychologist. But I couldn't get into college because I didn't take any of those exams. Fortunately, a therapist friend of the family uh, was teaching at NYU, and he managed to get me into two classes non-matric, or two or three. So I went in, and I did very well, and then they allowed me to matriculate. For the first year, I was at NYU. Then my father died, and I didn't have any money. I couldn't afford it, so I had to work two or three jobs, and I went and graduated from Queens College in psych, and then went to the uh, graduate school for my PhD. In social psychology, I did not get my doctorate. I got everything but. I didn't, get, I didn't finish it. 
I wouldn't say that I really got involved in the movement because, as I said, I, um, I was going to college. I had to work three different jobs and study and become a psychologist. But I do remember two things that were very um, impressive to me. One was Anais Nin, who came to speak to the, uh, to the literature students. And I remember a very small, porcelain-like figure, and very moving and romantic. And then there was Florence Kennedy, who was this great black radical lawyer. And she was uh, an enormous personality. And she stood up there and she said, if men could get pregnant, abortion would be a sacrament. And you know, the words fuck were coming out all over. This is something else. I really was very impressed by this woman. I was impressed by her power, by her intensity. Um, so there were those two, those two events. Uh, and many, many years later, she became an extremely good friend. And, and then sort of the circle, the circle curved in. One of the positions that I was working with was with a physician. And when abortion became legal in New York, he was very progressive and uh, wanted to get involved in providing services for the health insurance plan and asked me if I was interested, you know, and I thought, well, this is a very interesting concept. You know, it was very pioneering. Uh, nobody had done it before. All of a sudden, abortion was legal. I never thought, never thought about abortion, but I remembered a conversation when I was very young in Philadelphia that my parents had had about a doctor who cut up a woman into a lot of little pieces and put her down the drain of a kitchen sink. You know, and I remember my child's mind thinking, how, you know, how could that be? And why did that happen? And hearing the word illegal abortion, illegal abortion. So that, that just came in. And then um, I started to work uh, and develop the first services for abortion patients. And you have to really realize that at that time, it was totally radical, revolutionary, and pioneering and new. Monday, abortion is illegal. It's a crime. It's a sin. It's a terrible thing. Tuesday, it's legal. And women are lining up in different areas, particularly in New York and four other states, to get them. Now, there's no counseling. There's no education. There's no inform. There is nothing. So, how do these services become delivered? Now, some of the doctors knew this was happening, and set up bigger clinics in New York City. But I, uh, with Dr. Gold, who was the physician that I got involved with, this was, you know, a small service. So I had to think about, well, how do I answer the phones? What do I say? How are appointments made? And who do I get to deal with the patients after the procedure? And then came the first patient. And this patient's name was Helen. And she came from New Jersey because abortion was still illegal in that state. I want the people, young people particularly listening to me, to understand, think of a free speech or the right to assemble or the right to vote being legal in New York, but not being legal in New Jersey or in Rhode Island or Dakota and Utah. And this is what women's reproductive freedom means. It can't be done in a state-by-state -state basis. But at that time, it was. And we're going back to it. But let me come back to my point. So the woman comes in. She's white. She has her husband with her. She has two children. And she's terrified. She very, very economically pressed. And actually, that's one of the main reasons that women continue to have abortions. They just can't afford to have children. And she was terrified. And uh, somebody said, well, you go in and just talk to her. Now, what am I going to say? You know, I'm 24, 25 years old. You know, I know what the procedure is. I've read about it. You know, uh, then I think of all the psychology courses that I took. And then I think, well, Ford really is not relevant or young to this situation. And then I just sat there and I started to talk to her. And then after we spoke, I went in with her to the procedure room and held her hand 
while he dilated and did the abortion. Now, at that time, and even in some clinics now, there was no general anesthesia. So everyone was getting abortions under local. And they can be extremely uncomfortable. And I held her hand, and I remember I had to take off my rings because she was squeezing so hard. And I went through that part of the procedure with her, and then I went in with her as she was in the recovery room bed. And that was the event that wed me to almost 50 years now of this work and this struggle. It was that one individual woman making that powerful, profound decision at that one point in time. Is that a movement? At that time, it was not. Did it become one? In a way, yes, it did. But it was a very, I, I call my politicization from the ground up. It wasn't as if I was doing theoretical work or reading or writing books. I was dealing with the women on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's what politicized me so very profoundly. It was never theoretical to me. I could write theoretically about it, think theoretically about it, but I knew it was about these women's lives that I saw every day. Yeah, okay. 1974. Now, again, you have to remember there was nothing that was women's health. There was no discipline. There was no concept. There was no organized thinking about the reality of women's health. There were a lot of women and girls going to doctors because they always, their mothers would take them when they had to have their periods or to talk to them about maybe about birth control, when they had to have their babies, maybe during menopause. So women were the majority of the consumers of medical services and were the deciders of when the other people in their their families would go, but basically there was no discipline or concept, you know. So I consider myself one of the midwives of the whole concept of women's health at this point. So HIP decided to have a women's health forum. So this is the first time that we were going to come together. Uh, Bella Abzug spoke, Barbara and en and I spoke, and we were talking about women's health and how it had to be basically uh, thought of what do women need that is different from men. You know, now women's bodies are different from men, and you know, maybe at this point I may be attacked for non social gender constructionism, but there definitely is a biological difference, and there was no difference in the way they were treated. And then what I found I called iatrogenic pregnancies, which is I would see all these women come into the doctor's office, or come, in, no, come into choices, and I said, well, how did you get pregnant? Were you using birth control? Oh, my doctor told me I didn't have to use birth control. My doctor said, go off the pill and use foam. Or you don't have to refit your diaphragm. I mean, so now remember, there's no internet a long time ago. <laughs> Right? There's no internet. There's no our bodies ourselves. There's nobody to call the only arbiters, the only area of knowledge are the physicians themselves. Most of these physicians are men, and most of them have their own prejudices, and this is what they're teaching. So what was happening is I call it iatrogenic because that sort of system caused problems or diagnosis. So I said, Physicians, by their miscommunication, are actually causing unwanted pregnancies. So I developed the philosophy of patient power, which was the concept that women had to be informed consumers. What was happening in 1975, I read an article that the highest rate of breast cancer was in Long Island. And there were some theories that it was because of the industrialization or something about it being near water. They weren't very sure. But women in Long Island had the most breast cancers, statistically. I was near Long Island. I was living in Queens. And then I, I also understood that at that point in time, when women had a lump or found a lump, they would be taken in, they would be put under anesthesia, the lump would be removed, it would be sent to the lab, and if there was a metastasis or if there was cancer within that lump, the breast would be removed right there and then 
while the woman was on the table under anesthesia. She didn't know. She wasn't asked. She just had either a single or a double mastectomy. That was what was happening. So I thought about this, and I thought, well, this is abusive, invasive, and, you know, how can you just take off a breast without even talking to me about what's happening with me? So I developed a program called STOP, Second Treatment Option Program. And in this concept, women would come in, they would have their biopsy. I worked with a breast surgeon, and the biopsy was done at Choices. And then we would send it out to the lab, we would bring them back, and we would have a counseling session, discuss what we found, discuss the possibilities, discuss the treatment concept. We also worked with SHARE, which is a group of women who had breast cancer in the past and who were sort of a peer group counseling session. So that was quite a, an, extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary breakthrough. I actually... I went to see at the time, I remember the president of Blue Cross, and I remember a couple of people telling me, she's a woman, she'll listen to you, she's a woman. She's, I said, okay, okay. So <laughs> I went to see the female president of Blue Cross, and she thought it was a great idea too, and that maybe we could get it reimbursed, but somehow at that point in time, it just didn't happen. Um, I don't know what the forces were, probably financial, but power, medical, Whatever they were, it wasn't the right time. And sometimes, you know, I've, I've really learned that very deeply, that um, you can have a great idea, you can take a risk, and, you know, if it, if it doesn't succeed at that point, or if it fails, or if it's not right, walk away, walk away, like I did the first time I went to Russia for the whole of, of the Choices East. That, you know, you can plant a seed, and then it develops later. Maybe not with you, but it can develop later. I remember it very, very distinctly. I'm listening to the radio. It was a Sunday morning, and I hear, uh, what was he, Congressman Henry Hyde. Republican Congressman Henry Hyde has now passed the Hyde Amendment because Henry Hyde felt he wanted, he also had a rescue fantasy. His rescue fantasy was a problem for women. He wanted to stop all abortions, you see. But because he couldn't save all the babies, he could just save the babies of the poor, his amendment was going to cut off all Medicaid funding for poor women. Okay, And it's still in existence as I speak here today. In the year of our Lord, 2019, we still have the Hyde Amendment. So I'm listening to this. And I am, my God, this is going to affect my patients. These are the women I see every day. These are the women that are struggling, the poor women, minority women. Again, it was egregious. It couldn't stand. I found myself a PR agent. You know, I mean, there was no internet. I found one. <laughs> and I said, I have to debate these people because they were all over TV. You know, a lot of them were uh, pa pastors and they were on the Sunday morning shows and I would watch them all the time because, I, you know, I, I think it's really important to, to know, know your enemies deeply. Okay, so I would listen and I watch. I said, I, I've got it, I've got it. But so I was booked all over the country, you know, and I would just go in there by myself. You know, when they, I, I, I debated every single leader of the anti-abortion, right to life as they call the movement. The best one, the best one was Jerry Falwell. Jerry Falwell was the one who led the moral majority, and he never really debated, but, uh, you know, uh, he debated me on television in Detroit, Michigan. And I'm sitting there, and he looks at me, and he said, Miss Hoffman, how many abortions did your facility do last year? And I said, hmm, Reverend, I think we've done about 9,000. And he said, 9,000 abortions? 9,000 abortions, how will you meet your maker with the blood of 9,000 babies on your hands? And I said, when I meet her, I'll be very proud that I fought for women's rights. And he said, her? Did you say God was a woman? I said, no, Reverend, God is beyond gender. So when I want to get a little comic relief, I, I watch that. But that was, uh, that was really something else. I, you know, I, I stopped debating after a while because uh, when they wanted me to 
sit on the stage and actually debate the brother of one of the killers of a doctor I refused. It was, in my mind, like going into the concentration camps and saying, now we're going to have 15 minutes from the Jews, and then we'll have 15 minutes from the guards. In 1986, I decided to direct, write, and produce a half an hour cable television show. Um, again, I'd have never done it before. It was the first time that there was a feminist cable show. I worked with producers and directors. I had leading feminists on. Uh, I would do a, an editorial or an essay. And uh, one interesting story was when Betty Friedan was scheduled to come on and, and do a Q&A with me. And you know, Betty was notorious for being extremely difficult. And I, um, I don't have that much problem with difficult people being one myself and growing up in a family of musicians. I mean, we were all very impossible. So I understood that kind of behavior in a sense. So she came in very angry because the taxi that I sent for her was late, you see. And then there were a couple of interns sitting in that room, and they were sitting there with her book, right? The Feminist Mystique, you know, like little acolytes waiting for her to come in so they could hand her the book so she would <laughs> she would give her name and write her name. And she comes in, what the fuck is, who are these people? I don't want to wait here. You made me wait for an, you know, and I said, Betty, you know, I don't have control over these drivers. They, you know, it's difficult in the truck. Well, I only have 20 minutes, and that's all I'm going to give you, and I'm going to sit on the stage, and I want the timer, and I'm out of here in 20. I said, that's fine. That's fine. You know, so we go up, we sit there. I had the Q&A with her, and as we're into, we're into it, we're engaging, we're speaking, she's like, oh, 20 minutes, and she gets up, she just, just gets up, and she has a microphone on her, and you know, part of it is hanging off, and she's going in the mic, and I said, oh, excuse me, excuse me, Betty, just, it's fine if you leave, but please leave the microphone here, and then I just, I just turned to the camera, and I said something like, as we see, our guest had to leave us, but we can continue to discuss that issue. That was was a very, uh, very interesting. Uh, I suppose she thought she was being powerful, but it was a little bit ridiculous. Anyway, that was that was Betty. Why did I go to Russia? Well, I would say that Russia came to me at the time. I was um, on Queens Boulevard in Forest Hills, and there was a large expat Russian community, and we would see patients who would come in having five, six, seven previous abortions, 10, 11, okay, you know, I understood that there was no birth control, it was very difficult to get. Um, then there was a patient, you know, I remember the counselor came up to me and she said, Miss Hoffman, this patient has had 35 abortions. I said, what are you talking about? She says she's had 35 abortions. So I went down and I spoke to her and she had had 35 abortions. I think she was about 36 years old. Um, that was so egregious, you know, and I understood the reasons, you know. Um, in Russia, abortion was just part of life. I mean, you either had these procedures, and many times they were not legal, um, and you risked, you know, your fertility or, or your health, or you, you know, you, you just uh, had a child that you didn't want, and the orphanages just bulged out even more. So... I said to myself, well, this is, you know, this is really, really egregious. I, you know, this can't stand. I go upstairs and I, I laugh when I think about this because it's my rescue fantasy writ large. Everybody that's in healthcare has a little bit of it. You know, I'm going to save this person when I did my internship in psych to Creedmoor Hospital. And I went into one of the wards and they were young adolescents, and one was banging her head against the wall, and another one, I mean, sick, unfortunately very sick. And I just thought I, I would love to be get, go in there and touch them and heal them. And, you know, and that, that kind of feeling that you just wanted to make it all better or for this one person, make that world all better. So I wanted to make the world better for Russian women. So I said, I have to go to Russia. <laughs> so I managed, uh, with the help of a couple of my staff, to get an invitation from uh, a couple of government officials. And I and 11 of my staff went over there for about two weeks. 
and um, we uh, operated in hospital number 53. We showed them our abortion procedure. We brought over the anesthesiologists. I gave a talk in the uh, literary society, and we had somebody that brought over a lot of condoms because they had condoms in Russia, but they called them galoshes because they were so thick. And of course, as you can imagine, the men were not very keen on putting them on, and the women were not insisting that they do, so they weren't used very much. But we had the support of a couple of uh, drug companies who made them, so we took them over there. We were mobbed on that stage. And I'm talking about professors and doctors, and they couldn't get enough. You know, they couldn't get their hands on enough of them. So that was my, my first foray. I, I and about 12 other feminists at the time, I'm talking 25 years ago, wrote an open letter to Boris Yeltsin about the state of women's health, women's reproductive health, and um, the dangers that they faced. Uh, I have that letter. I'm very proud of it. We sent it. I can't tell you he opened it or he read it, but nothing was done. But we, we formed it and we wrote it, which is the point. So that's when I went to Russia. I did a study with Adelphi University really looking at why women have abortions. What is the main reason that women are having abortions? This was during Reagan's tenure. And I think we, we had about an N of uh, 500 women. It was a very, very large, uh, large uh, study. And one of the main reasons that kept coming up and kept coming up was economics. Most women were having abortions because they couldn't give their child what they felt was the kind of life that they wanted to, educationally, or they were alone, or whatever it was, educational pressures were, were enormous. And this was during the time that Reagan was saying, if anybody remembers, ketchup was a vegetable. Now, I know we're living in a very alternative reality now, but that certainly was something new to me. I mean, ketchup is not a vegetable. It's not something I would want to feed my daughter as a vegetable. And he's saying, well, you know, they put ketchup on their hamburgers. That's a vegetable. So I called this study abortionomics. And basically, I accused Ronald Reagan of creating these abortion statistics, of driving up the abortion rate because of his economic policies. And it remains true to this day that a great number and most of the women who are having abortions are having them for economic reasons, although sometimes in counseling you, will, you may ask them, well, what if you had the money? What if you had all the money you needed? And they may be a little, you know, I think I'd still have it, you know? And that may be due to the fact that uh, they're not comfortable enough with saying, I just don't want to have this child, which is a whole other issue of stigma and shame and not owning the fact that you're making this moral choice and that this choice is ultimately yours to make. For me, the movement was always individual and very, very personal. I mean, it, it just um, it came from that individual connection that I had with the patients. And it expressed itself through my own, through my own imagination and my own history. And I say my imagination, I, I said that I was and am an only child. And when I was growing up in the 50s, there were really no role models. You know, I actually wore uh, skirts with poodles on them <laughs> and cinch belts. Um, and crinolines, so that when you'd sit down, you'd have to put your hands down like this. And you know, I mean, of course, my cousin was a, a prodigy, and we had you know famous musicians, and I was going to be a concert pianist. But aside from that, I mean, the other things that women did were, you know, nurses and teachers, and they got married. And uh, then, when I was twelve years old, I went to the uh, went to the library in Jamaica. I was always a reading, reading. And I found a book about Elizabeth I. And I was, um, <laughs> what, what should I say? I mean, it started a, uh, 
one could call it a compulsion, an obsession, a love affair, an interest, whatever, from that point on. I mean, all of a sudden, here this little girl, I'm this little girl in Queens, the only thing I know, or, you know, either you're on the stage at Carnegie Hall, or you're going to school in Philadelphia thinking about I'll be a nurse, or I'll marry a doctor, and then there's this woman who ruled the world, you know, extraordinarily powerful, survived almost being beheaded, her mother was beheaded, you know, brilliant stateswoman, spoke six languages. I thought, my God, you know, you know, I knew about Alexander the Great and about Napoleon, but this was something else. So this started me down the road of reading about these great personalities, particularly, particularly Elizabeth, and of course, Mary Queen of Scots, and, and the two sides of female nature, power, nurture. And um, Elizabeth was, in a sense, my role model. Now, that, that's very strange, really, really strange, because I wasn't born, you know, in line to any throne. But the, the intensity of her survival strategies, her um, ability to be political, uh, and all of the things that she had accomplished in a tremendously difficult environment, even though she had all of this power, it was a totally male world. I mean, she was constantly fighting to survive for her throne. The people closest to her were always trying to betray her. She, she had about 50 assassination attempts. You know, so there were so many things in a strange way that I could identify with. So, so there, was, there was Elizabeth, then there was Merle Hoffman, who left the world of music and, you know, performance and Chopin and Bach, and she's now holding women's hands as they're having their abortions. And in a very strange way, abortion, the war against legal abortion, became my ability or became the stage for me to ride my white horse and to be that great Amazon warrior defender where I can protect and rescue and defend, you know, and conquer. So it all came together. So the movement was out there, and the movement came into me. But I had a whole paradigm of my own imagination and romantic notions that it fit into that it fit into. I remember I gave a, a speech in Bryant Park on January 22nd, and, uh, you know, and I would prepare very deeply for these speeches. And I felt that I was giving, you know, like a speech Elizabeth gave at Tilbury to her troops. I have, you know, the heart and stomach of a, of a king, and a king of England, too. I have the weak and feeble body of all. Extraordinary speeches. I mean, you know, Shakespeare, all of it. So all of it came into that. And, you know, the, uh, the women, the people I'm fighting for, uh, the principles that I fight for, the ethics that I try to live up to. So feminism as a movement is important to me, but it, it's, a, it's another level of growth. Uh, and it's not the end, it's, it's, a, it's a way of seeing, but it's not the final way of seeing the world. How is my involvement in the movement of fact? How does, how does it not? <laughs> how, does, how does the movement not, I mean, there is no separation. There's really no separation. The work, I live the work. I see, I see the world through my work, in a sense. Um, I feel that the mission is, is even stronger now. Um, I've gone through so much, so many decades. In two years, it'll be half a century since I founded Choices. And many things have remained the same, the women, the reasons. The protesters outside who were screaming at them that they're killing their babies, and other things have changed. But um, I don't, uh, I guess I would say my, I don't really have a personal life. I just don't make that differentiation. I mean, I mean my, my intimates, my friends, I mean, they're, they're, they're my friends, I love it, but we're, we share politics, we share literature, we share, you know, I, I, that's sort of a very, I, ha I can have fun, but I, I'm not somebody who needs a lot of fun things. 
I started them. I was never a joiner. I never liked, I never joined clubs. I never joined groups. You know, uh, I w co founded and was the first president of the National Abortion Federation. I founded, was the leader of the New York Pro Choice Coalition. I, um, I was a leader and um, I wanted to put my thoughts into action. And I had the confidence and the vision and the mission and the determination that I was destined to do this. So I, you know, I, I never really joined many organizations. I got people to join me and helped. I worked in coalitions all the time, but I, I was never members of any organizations in that sense. Why did I get so many comments about that tagline? The life and times of the woman who brought abortion from the back alley to the boardroom. I named it Intimate Wars Feminist Press. I <laughs> picked the tagline, and any of the women who write know how that happens, you know? But um, at that time, I wanted to stop and, and think about where I was how I got there. I knew that I would be written about and that I am written about. And I just wanted to write about myself in, a, in as an objective and mindful way as possible. And I think I'm pretty, pretty hard on myself in, in a couple of, in more than a couple of places in this book. Um, and put it on paper. It was, um, it was a deep experience. I had lost my mother and I lost a very, very close person to me. There was a death around me. I was feeling, feeling my mortality, not theoretically, but organically. And uh, I wanted to write it for my daughter, my daughter, Sasharina, who I had adopted from an orphanage in uh, Siberia when she was three years old, three years and two months, and I was 58. And uh, I adopted her because I never wanted to have a child until then. I had an abortion when I was 32 years old. I was married. I had everything I needed to bring that child into the world if I wanted to at that point. But I knew I didn't want to. I knew I didn't want to be detoured. I didn't want to be diverted. I didn't want to have to stop. <laughs> I always think of that uh, line from uh, Emily Dickinson because I could not stop for death. He kindly stopped for me. I didn't want to stop. So I had the abortion. And I always thought to myself, well, I could always adopt and I would think about, it. always a little girl, I would adopt a little girl and she'd be, of course, just like me and bright and curious and I would mentor her, educate her like a Renaissance princess. And then I said to myself, well, if I have this fantasy for more than 24 hours, I may act on it. And then it came to me. It came when I was 58, and it came so strongly, so strong that it was like a tsunami, and there was just no question but that I had to do this. <laughs> I just did it. You know, I, I went to Russia because that's where my heart and soul is. I have somewhat of a lot of a Russian soul. Went to Omsk in Siberia. That's where she was. And uh, I took that leap of faith. And that's what it is, I think, for anyone who uh, not only adopts but brings a child into this world. It is a, it is a major leap of faith. And, uh, you know, I'm a mother now. Yes, I'm a mother now. And uh, I used to, um, sometimes I would watch uh, some of these TV shows where they would have women on who accomplished a great deal. So a lot of times some actresses and the, the questioner would say, well, what's your greatest accomplishment? They had a lot of accomplishments. Of course, and they would always say, oh, it's my daughter or it's my son and I'm so, and I'd say to myself, that is such bullshit, you know, you, you created this, you wrote that, you know, you built this, you did, you brought up a kid, so what, everybody, and they're absolutely right, because <laughs> it's the hardest job in the world, and uh, it, it changed me radically, it made me far more, um, well, it filled me with a lot more humility. It filled me with a lot more empathy for the otherness of someone. 
for the fact that this was a, a life, a creature, a little girl that had nothing to do with me. And what is love? You know, what is a mother? She didn't even know what a mother was. One day she asked me, did I come from your stomach? And I said, no, you came from my heart. And, you know, it's, it was very, very, and it, is, it remains very deep, very profound, very challenging, and um, oh, it's a gift. It's a gift. My Sasharina. Now, Sasha is a name that I've always loved, and her name that was given to her in the orphanage was Irina, which means peace. And uh, I didn't want to take that away from her. I didn't want to take her name away. That's really, she had nothing. She had no clothes. She had nothing. She had, it was her own. But her name was her own. But I, I loved the name Sasha. And then I, I looked it up, and I saw that it meant defender of humanity. So when I put them together, defender of humanity and peace, it became Sasharina. And I thought, that's so beautiful. So I named her Sasharina. And she has her own name to live up to now. You know, you look at the television. Do you remember when the Yazidi women were fleeing and they had to, you know, they were trying to helicopter them out of, you know, that it's horrible. And um, worked with my friend Phyllis. We, we work a lot of Phyllis chess, a lot of political things, and got involved in sending over some uh, some supplies and helping to deal with that. I did some work in a uh, rape uh, crisis center in South Africa. Uh, I got involved with honor killing, you know. So all over the world, I mean, it's, in a sense, you know, people can get so, um, feel so powerless and so despairing because you feel, well, there's so much struggle, there's so much horror, there's so much despair in the world. What what can I do? And I always know and I always believe it's not, and I think it's the Talmud, the Torah, but <laughs> that it's not up to me to finish the journey, but it's my responsibility to start it or to take the first step. So I, I have learned that limitation and uh, the humility of understanding that I will do the most I can. So uh, if there's something that I can do, I'll do it, and I don't expect <laughs> I really don't expect to change the world. I did, but I, I don't anymore. I can change mine, and I can change the relationships that I have and make a difference in individuals, and uh, I can do the most I can. And I am very comfortable with that. I, uh, I'm asked very often, well, don't you get very depressed or frustrated because you see now after all this time and we're in a situation where it's the same thing you have people attacking you and uh, you know don't you feel it should be over and, and I, I tell them and I truly believe it's an edu it's an educational it's a generational struggle it's not one that's one you know freedom is not free you don't win it and take it and put it on the table and say here freedom now just sit and stay it's something, again, that's so dynamic, and that, that power and pushing them, that you have to be constantly vigilant and constantly aware. So being in the struggle itself, and here's Flo Kennedy again. She used to say to me, girl, you've got to love the struggle. You've got to love the struggle. And that's so important because the process is where is where my my feelings of accomplishment come. Just that I'm doing this, that I that I'm placed in this point in time. I'm thrown into history at this point in time, and I can have the ability to do this. Is enough. <laughs>